thank you everyone for taking the time for Saturday morning just to learn a little bit more about the Gray Fund. Here we're going to do a quick overview of the fund itself. We're going to jump into some of the risk factors both facing the multifamily industry as well as the just the general economy in 2022. And then we're going to do an overview of the first two fund assets and then leave time for some questions and answers. I mean, again, there's a chat feature. Please feel free to drop any questions and I will be checking periodically. Um, if I miss it during the presentation, we'll absolutely get to it near the end. Just as a quick disclaimer, the Gray Fund, it's an opportunity only open to accredited investors. You know, always consult your professional and financial advisors. Um, and this is not a specific offer to invest. Um, any offer to invest would be in the form of a private placement memorandum. Um, of which all the deal documents for the Gray Fund are now available, including our subscription booklet, the operating agreement, and the private placement memorandum. Um, you can go over to graycapitalllc.com slash, uh, or just graycapitalllc.com um, and log into the investment portal um, to view those documents. Um, you can also email myself, Spencer at graycapitalllc.com or William Costello, Costello <clears throat> at William at GreatCapitalLLC.com, and we'd be more than happy to send you over those documents. Um, but if you'd like to just first view the investment deck and learn just a little bit more, you can just go to gray.fund, um, fill out a quick form, and we'll send you over the investment deck right away. So as an overview, just on Great Capital's track record, um, we've invested in over 10,000 apartment units since um, launching 2015. And we've delivered solid returns to investors over that time period. Um, we've participated in a ton of projects, um, well over a billion dollars. And at the end of 22, we'll have gone full cycle um, on over 10 multifamily syndications as a GP. We believe in a high alignment of interest with large co-investments. And in general, just as a philosophical standpoint, we believe in high level of transparency and communication. So eventually the fund's gonna have anywhere between seven, 10 assets. Um, we have the possibility of going up to 15 assets, but we believe based on deal size, it will be around a portfolio of seven to 10 multifamily properties, targeting a fund, fund equity of $100 million um, with an eventual total asset value of $300 million. The term of the fund is up to 10 years, um, could be as short as five years. Um, projects held in the fund could be held um, even shorter than five years. And in the first four years of the fund, the fund has the option to reinvest, refinance, or sales proceeds to acquire new assets, which will really compound returns and be able to take advantage of a higher velocity of investment to drive a higher overall return. The fund features monthly distributions and the minimum investment for now is $100,000, but that minimum will be um, raising later in the summer well, that after July to $250,000. And I would say that's something to keep in mind if you are interested in investing under the 250 eventual minimum, um, you'll want to invest earlier because there will not necessarily be a capital call you know, every single month. There may only be you know, two capital calls before July. And so you wanna make sure you try to make that investment prior to July, if you want to invest under that $250,000 minimum threshold. The return profiles for the fund um, can be varied and we the structure of the fund so you can really tailor your own balance, individualized risk and return profile. Um, but really the two core blocks of the fund um, feature your income, but preferred return of 10%, again, distributed monthly, um, as well as growth options that can achieve anywhere up to four times equity multiple uh, over a 10 year period and uh, targeting an IRR is between 18 and 24%. In general, we're always looking at opportunities to exploit uh, market inefficiencies. That's why we love real estate because there are so many inefficiencies in the market we can take advantage of. But beyond that, we're always looking to find ways to add value, create value, force appreciation we like to take a you know a creative approach, really trying to understand what the best use and what the best additions and improvements to a property can be. Not always taking a cookie cutter approach, but really kind of taking each asset. I'm looking at it as an individually and seeing you know what's the best, um, what improvements are going to um, create the best sense of community at the property. 
there's an incredible amount of inflation in the market and we're supposed to take advantage of that. Multifamily apartments are one of the, if not the best hedge against inflation, perform extremely well in inflationary environments. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the fund obviously is diversified. Um, so compared to investing in one project or one syndication or just one or two, asset diversification significantly reduces volatility and risk. Also, by investing in real estate and private real estate specifically, you're just avoiding stock market volatility. There's also incredible tax benefits, benefits to real estate, including depreciation, which shelters vast majority of cash flow and income. And again, just the goal is not only income, but also capital multiplication. Some of the themes um, for the Gray Fund that we are highly focused on in the markets that we are, that we are in and we are targeting, um, e-commerce and logistics, suburban momentum, markets that are, have favorable tax and business climates, uh, meds and ed, so you know, medical facilities, hospitals, um, as well as universities and education, um, downsizing boomers, and again, this environment of inflation. And the two assets that I'm gonna be speaking about a little bit later today, the real focus is e-commerce, logistics, suburban momentum, tax-friendly markets, meds and ads, and inflation is just a general theme. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Some of the strategy, tactics, and criteria of the fund. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, because you can see there's a lot here. Again, I I'd recommend downloading the full investor presentation at gray.fund. Gray um, in general, we're targeting markets in the Midwest, growing secondary and tertiary markets. Um, in terms of the properties, though, 100 units or more, you know, we never we want to really see closer to 250, but anything over 100 units starts having the economies of scale where it makes sense. Vintages, properties that are built after the mid 1980s to really minimize uh, physical obsolescence. And in general, in terms of stat strategy and tactics, again, we're always looking for ways to add value, force appreciation, while also harnessing existing organic growth using a lot of data to really make tactical acquisition um, decisions. So these are some of the markets that we're targeting in the Gray Fund. I um, mean, you see we have our, some of our main targets and then we have some just al alternate targets that we are continuing to, mark, to monitor. Um, Indianapolis is our home market and it's our primary target market. We'll most likely have several assets um, in the Indianapolis MSA. Um, one of the first uh, projects in the fund will be in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the other states that we're targeting, um, Ohio, Kentucky, and Michigan, um, one, the second asset that we have under LOI is up in Lansing, Michigan, which is another market that we are targeting and very bullish on. Just briefly on some of the structures and the fees, as I mentioned earlier, um, the fund allows to really tailor your own risk and return profile, it really kind of just based on um, what you're looking to get out of a real estate investment. Um, adding that flexibility to have a you know solid investment but with a vehicle that's backed by a you know real asset, cash flowing asset, really the two building blocks that you can use to really create this return profile um, are A units, which represent or make up 25% of the total fund equity. Um, they feature a 10% preferred return, but no further upside. Um, but they are in a priority position in the capital stacks, so really the lowest risk. They're gonna be the first to be paid. The class B units are more focused on upside. So they're in a second position, so slightly higher risk, but they do still feature a 7% preferred return, followed by an 80-20 split, 80% to the B members, 20% to the GP. And then after an 18% IRR, which essentially really means that you know, we've done a really good job and have a great return, that split switches to 60-40 B members to the GP. And those B units are targeting that 18 to 24% IRR, the three to four times equity multiple. And since the B units are in the second position to be paid, um, cash flow may be lower in the first several years. So if you are still focused on income, it may make sense to do a blend of the A and B units. Um, or if you are mostly focused on income, but want some upside, you may want to focus on mostly A, but then allocate some to B. And again, it's not really a binary choice of I only want to do A or B, we really see it as a way to create, again, just a customized return profile based on what you're looking for. And you can find this um, in the deck as well, but we've really laid out some what those return profiles are. And so for the majority of investors who kind of want a return profile similar to 
past great capital projects that you know had a eight percent preferred return and a 70 30 split the um, growth weighted option which is 25 percent a units 75 percent b units really is kind of in a good sweet spot because it features a 7.75 percent preferred return and still uh, IRR projected to be 17 and a half percent or three times equity multiple um, so really still solid returns. You're getting the advantage of the compounding of the B units, but still good cash flow from the A units as well. Um, now, if you want to go on the opposite side and mostly focused on income, but you say, I do want a little bit of pop at the end, the income weighted, which is 75% A units or 25% B units, you're still going to get a, you're going to a really nice uh, preferred return of nine and a quarter percent. And that's a blended preferred return. Um, but still a nice IRR at 12.5%, you know, and just keep in mind, you know, that the long-term average for, for the stock market since 1926 is 10%. Um, so even the A class going all total income, all A, A units, you're still getting the same average return of the stock market as provided really over the last hundred years. Obviously the stock market has done very well the last two years, not doing so hot um, in the current moment. But just in general, thinking about 10% monthly distributions that are backed by real assets and stable markets, um, but you also have all the advantages that real estate has, including the tax benefits of having accelerated depreciation and able to have really tax sheltered income, which we see the majority of income being sheltered really for the first five to seven years of the life of an investment in multifamily. Here's a quick projection of cash flows. Um, as you can see, things really ramp up to year five. I'm still starting out of the gate, you know, around uh, just a little bit under eight percent. Now, these are this is just um, this is just an estimation of cash flows because obviously we've not acquired all seven assets. But I, I would recommend in the fund deck take a look at this because you can see that we've really we've anticipated doing some value adds on a couple projects, selling them in year three several refinances throughout. Um, and so it's really a dynamic strategy that allows for the safety of a longer term hold, um, the flexibility, but also getting all the advantages of a, again, a higher velocity investment and in compounding, which some long term investments, um, they just lack that benefit. So if you have any questions about the Gray Fund, again, feel free to drop them in the chat in near the end of the presentation. I can get into any aspects and I have other slides to get into other details if anyone has any specific specific questions. But I just wanna talk about the risks to multifamily. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. I think uncertainty is a good term to describe the environment we're in. And we saw uncertainty in 2020, um, back in the pandemic. And it, but today it's even it's even crazier. We have the, the war in Ukraine currently, we have, you know, politics are, are always insane, but now they may be more uncertain than ever. Obviously, we've been dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, we have inflation, high gas prices. Um, you know, it, it's it, it's quite a timeline we all find ourselves in. Not to mention the stock market, the VIX, the volatility index is way up year over year. And the stock market is down, at least S&P 500 is down quite a bit, at least a year to date, but quite a bit up over the last two years. Uncertainty creates opportunity, it creates inefficiencies, it makes people do things in a different way, and things aren't as balanced. And that is what is exciting to me is to be able to take advantage of these, this, uncert this uncertain environment. Because if we take, again, a long-term look, and now this is a chart, and this is, this is looking at, this, uh, I think, believe the S&P 500, or the stock market, but this is a chart of all of major geopolitical um, events, really since World War II. And I don't have really geopolitics as a risk factor because it, it's so macro, but I did want to touch on it a little bit because obviously there's a war raging right now. But even after the Pearl Harbor attack, you know, just there was a, some slight declines in the stock market, but over the long term, there was no major crash. And we can go back to any other of these major geopolitical um, events that took place over the over more than 50 years. And we see really it's even the stock market, which can be very volatile, that can be very reactive to news in the short term. On the long term, if you focus on the fundamentals, we really kind of keep moving forward. And I think that's 
important to keep in mind is separating, you know, the noise and the fundamentals of housing. Um, you know, certainly macroeconomic events can affect renters and the economy and a recession is certainly not good for any asset class. But we have to ask ourselves, you know, how, you know, will a war in Ukraine affect, you know, housing demand in the Midwest? Um, and actually, when we do an analysis, um, even though the war is absolutely, you know, a horrible thing, the some of the results end up actually driving multifamily um, through more inflation. Um, so it, it's a quite an interesting um, situation. But w what can we do? Um, because if there's uncertainty, not taking action is is not an option right now. Because ta not taking action is a choice in and of itself. Um, not taking action at times during 2020, there was a you there was serious um, opportunity cost um, and loss to for not taking action, sitting on your hands um, during the pandemic. Now, that was an uncertain time and everyone was waiting to see what would happen. But if you were paying attention during 2020 and you were tracking the data on a month by month basis or even a higher frequency, and you, we were seeing you know, relatively early on that things were relatively stable and that the floor was not falling out, we proceeded to make acquisitions and made some of the best acquisitions we've ever made um, in the firm's history during 2020. Because we were quantifying the risk, we took steps to mitigate it, and we adapted to the current environment. So that's what I want to talk about: some of these risk factors, how to mitigate it, how, how to mitigate, quantify, mitigate, and adapt. So the first risk facing the market that is top of mind for everyone in any asset class is Fed tightening and a potential interest rate shock. Um, the Federal Reserve has ended their quantitative easing buying of mortgage-backed securities. Um, and they're expected to raise interest rates next week, um, at least on the Fed funds rate, by most likely 25 basis points. Some Fed fund futures um, market futures markets are anticipating up to seven interest rate hikes this year. But I, I don't know how much weight I would put on some of those futures markets at this point. But regardless, it's important to take a look because obviously the cost of borrowing capital is significantly important. Um, and to be able to really quantify... Um, this risk factor, we're looking to a research report that Berkadia put out um, a little over a month and a half ago, I believe, um, and it titles an interest rate stagflation, inflation, and monetary policy, um, all related to multifamily. I think that was a, a, I think it's a very kind of apt piece for the times. Some of the key takeaways um, is that change in monetary policy appear to take five to six months, sorry, five to six quarters to affect leveraged apartment returns. Um, but surprisingly, real apartment returns outperform equities during times of quasi stagflation. And we haven't really had real stagflation in a while, but real apartment returns still outperform the stock market. Um, they're telling us to keep a close eye on the, the 10 year treasury break even inflation rates. And then average leverage apartment returns tend to remain stable even during high times of inflation which makes a lot of sense because you're re-signing leases, one lease on a yearly basis. But if you have a large portfolio and think about the gray fund, uh, seven to 10 assets, we're talking, you know, easily, um, you know, over a thousand un apartment units, you're re-signing new leases on a daily basis. And so we have the ability over the entire portfolio to track inflation on a daily basis. So higher inflation is actually very beneficial to a multifamily investment. And, and the, Multifamily has just historically proven time and time again to track inflation. Um, then the tape, taper tra tantrum, um, because you know, not only is the Fed raising interest rates, you know, they're going to be unwinding their balance sheet. You know, looking back to 2013 at the last taper tantrum, multifamily was essentially unfazed. But let's actually get into look at some numbers. Um, average leverage apartment returns in an inflationary environment. Um, you can see that really in the one to 4% inflation range, multifamily apartments perform very well and they really start performing well, getting up to 7%. But the takeaway here is, you know, inflation can cause a lot of uncertainty, but inflation means higher rents and continuing to drive returns. Um, so while inflation can be scary from a macroeconomic standpoint, if you're allocated to apartments, you should really be able to sleep well at night. And if you're concerned about inflation, rising gas prices, 
multifamily is where you want to be. Now, this next graph looks at the relation to apartment yields and the 10-year treasury. So that we're looking at, you know, let's look at rising interest rates. There's really not a great correlation. Um, it, and it's there, Bercadia's um, conclusion is the relationship is not straightforward. You can see that returns go up kind of in this kind of between zero and, you know, 2%. And they seem to decline over a period and they go up when the rates are even higher. Um, so it's, it's less certain of, or it's less, there's less of a correlation or direct correlation, at least between leveraged apartment returns and just, you know, the 10 year treasury or just interest rates in general. And a lot of that is because, you know, as interest rates rise, assuming that inflation is high and rents are also rising. So it's not just that inflate that interest rates go up and returns go down. That's obviously just not the case. This is again looking at um, the 10 year yield as well as again private apartment returns related to the 2013 taper tantrum. Um, that's been a, con a major concern. But if you really can see in this, I believe it's a blue line, um, there was really no effect um, from the taper tantrum. In fact, returns went up slightly. Um, but there's no real correlation between um, taper tantrum or tightening of the balance sheet and apartment returns are really somewhat isolated. Now let's add a look at stagflation. Stagflation has been um, talked about more recently. Now stagflation is essentially you know, high inflation and low GDP growth um, or high unemployment. Um, and so they took a couple examples of environments since 1987 that was quasi um, stagflationary. Um, you know, stagflation was coined in the 1970s. Um, and what they found is that, you know, while the, the Wilshire 5000, so, you know, broad index of the stock market um, had about a 3.8%, um, private apartment returns significantly outperformed, um, especially compared to higher growth asset classes such as technology companies that might be comprised in the NASDAQ. So we've really, we've quantified the risk, but what can we do to mitigate and adapt? Um, because just as we can say, all right, well, there's less correlation here. doesn't mean there aren't risks. There aren't things that we can do to um, really prevent the downside and try to maximize the upside. A couple things to do is one, use fixed rate debt, um, or if you are using floating rate debt, certainly have a rate cap and stress test your models up to that rate cap and really assume that higher um, range of interest rates that you can have on your loan. Very important to watch organic growth um, to really tailor, make sure your value add strategy makes sense. Um, it may not make sense to spend a significant amount of capital you know, doing a certain renovation, maybe a cosmetic renovation, if there's already an incredible amount of organic rent growth that you're already achieving, and especially if uh, expenses are rising. Um, and like in the environment we're in right now where you can't get supplies, expenses are rising, you might just be able to take advantage of that organic growth. Um, but at the same time, there may be times if that organic growth is slightly lower, you may need to conduct a value add in forest appreciation more manually. Risk number two is oversupply. Um, this is, I keep hearing people talk about oversupply in the housing market. Now, of course, that's juxt juxtaposed with um, the fact that we're in a housing shortage right now and housing crisis, and we just simply haven't built enough, but you know, leave it to developers. Um, there, if there is blood in the water, they will build eventually. Um, and just as we've seen in headlines and research reports, um, the industry throughout the United States could build in this article 400,000. I've seen also seen reports up to 500,000 new apartment rentals um, being delivered in 2022. Um, but one key um, point to note on that um, fact is in the third paragraph in this article is you know the Sun Belt. Certain markets, all markets aren't created equal, and the Sun Belt is poised to account for. 25% of all the new units um, with, you know, Dallas, Dallas, Phoenix, Austin, Houston, Nashville, and Atlanta, and I think Huntsville should be added to this as well, really leading the way, um, really just seeing an incredible amount of new supply coming into those markets. I will add that there's a lot of demand in those markets as well in migration, um, but those are the markets that you could see in, in that imbalance shift to all of a sudden seeing too much building because every developer and every investor are crowding into some of these Sunbelt markets. 
which we see as a potential risk factor. Looking at just starts and permits for multifamily housing, you know, you see we definitely are, you know, at a very nice peak in terms of starts and housing, but for, for starts and permits. Um, but what I find interesting is we're really just on the same trajectory and trend. If you look at this trend line, this trend line, the, the pre-2014 trend line, we're really on pace and slightly below that, uh, that sorry, that pre-2015 trend line. In post-2015, it really kind of leveled off. And this has really led to us just not building enough housing, which has you know, caused some of the this housing crisis we find ourselves in. Um, just quick, some quick statistics. 45% um, in you, multifamily housing starts just in 2021. Permits, 55% have increased. Um, existing home inventory, it's 1.6 months of inventory. And there's a 5.8 million uh, house gap um, for single family homes compared to household formation. We can have all the plans and permits we want, but there's still construction backlogs. This is a construction backlog indicator um, from, I believe, this month. And you, see there, you can see there, or oh, sorry, from January 22. Um, we still have an eight month backlog of, um, for construction. So that, that, that's pretty significant. And just look at, I mean, just looking at this chart, we just haven't built enough housing and just dropped off after, you know, really 2007, 2008. And we've just have never recovered. We just never have. And at the same time, we've seen an incredible amount of household growth over the last several years. And this is just looking now at single family home prices um, or single, sorry, single family home supply. Um, again, you know, millennials are at an age where they would like to buy a home, but there are no homes to purchase and they are too expensive for, for most. Um, even if they could afford the monthly payment, you know, coming up with the fifty to $100,000 down payment, um, even as saving rates are at all time high and the consumer is in a um, historically incredible position, um, most just don't have that type of savings. And many are also coming to the realization that you know, they're not viewing their home as an asset, more of as a liability. And maybe the best investment for their, their largest chunk of their net worth may not always correlate where, with where they would like to live. This is just um, some of the markets with the highest amount of construction as a percentage of inventory. Again, I mentioned Huntsville earlier um, and Nashville are two high flyers that I would want to pay attention to. Now, both have great um, you know, demand fundamentals. Um, but you can have great demand, but you can still build too much housing. One way to mitigate it, which we'll get to in a second, is you know, finding markets that have really solid growth, um, but aren't seeing the oversupply. And that would be like a market like Indianapolis, where it has incredible amount of demand, incredible amount of absorption, but incredible amount of rent growth and population growth, but we're just not seeing all of the supply coming in. And partially it's because so many of these Sunbelt metros are just, you know, they're in the limelight and they are gaining so much investor interest interest and um, interest from developers. So again, we're gonna look to mitigate and adapt, we're gonna look for balanced markets. We also wanna diversify. We don't wanna have all our eggs in one basket, so we wanna be in several markets. And then in those markets themselves, we wanna be very sub-market specific, neighborhood specific to look at you know, where the, the lack of supply is, but it is still growing. And, that, and that's what gets us really excited. I'm gonna speak about a little bit later on um, one of our fund assets, just so much demand, just no supply. Cap rate expansion, certainly a risk. You know, cap rates are is the main metric used to value multifamily properties. And if cap rates increase, we certainly could see prices decline. We also can see cap rates expand and prices still go up though. Um, if cap rates are rising, it typically means we are in an inflationary environment and inflation means um, continued rent growth. So we may see cap rates move up. While at the same time, rents are moving up, top line revenue is growing. And so we may more see flat or, you know, little price growth um, kind of in a, you know, a, a non-ideal environment. But it's still, it's something we have to pay attention to because cap rates are at absolute all-time lows, absolute all-time lows. Um, I think we're going to see probably average cap rates in the United States below four and a half percent. I can see even four and a quarter percent for this year. And there are many are projecting we could be at four percent or below four percent next year. 
this is a correlation between cap rates and um, and um, uh, B, BAA rated corporate bonds. And the reason why we're showing this is because it's one of the it's one of the metrics that actually is somewhat correlated to cap rates. So I think it'll be important to watch some of the corporate bond yields um, compared to cap rates. Then also, again, looking at this yield spread, um, you know, the, there's not a clear correlation between cap rates and interest rates. As we looked at recently, there's not necessarily a correlation between interest rates and returns um, because that those aren't the only two variables. You have your business plan adding value, forcing appreciation. You also have all the organic growth that is occurring during those periods. And so even, in, um, you know, back in, and I remember this, we were, we were investing a lot of apartments at this time between 2016 and 2000, um, you know, in like 2018, where we saw interest rates rising, we still saw, you know, solid apartment uh, returns and, you know, really the cap rate continued to go down as interest rates rose and the amount of investor demand currently in the market, which we'll get to in a second, I think that will also offset that. And again, just looking at these returns compared to um, uh, interest rate environments, there's not a huge correlation. Another reason I think cap rates are going to stay low, um, however, is just the amount of money that is looking to be placed in multifamily assets. There's currently a record uh, dry powder sitting on the sidelines. This is just the already pre-committed capital, um, basically $250 billion dollars ready to deploy into apartments as soon as they can find the right opportunity. Um, this will most likely keep apartment values buoyed up as they're just, they're, the alternatives of investment are just not as ideal as multifamily and more and more institutions, family offices, high net worth individuals, and just nor, uh, anyone is looking to allocate themselves to these real assets that track inflation. You can imagine there was interest in multifamily prior to this inflationary environment. Now that we're in an, an incredible inflationary environment, multifamily just looks like much more, um, even more appealing. So how do, we, how do we mitigate and adapt for cap rate expansion? It's such a macro force, it's very difficult to do, but um, one thing is to invest in more stable markets, maybe more linear growth markets, not exponential growth markets. Some of those markets that have grown so much that if something happens, they could really correct. Whereas if we haven't seen a really a, uh, you know, a hockey stick curve, there's less to correct and we can predict a little bit more. Forcing appreciation is another way we can mitigate um, risk because by forcing the value, you know, we just have more cushion and more equity build up um, than if we were just kind of letting the property, you know, grow on its own. And then I think the most important um, way to, to mitigate and in through adapting is the ability to hold long. Now, it may be more beneficial to dispose of an asset, you know, after three to five years of holding it, if market conditions are appropriate, get a higher velocity of money and inside the fund, um, if we fully execute a value, our value add business plan, you know, by year, you know, by year three, if there's a great opportunity to refinance or sell that asset, um, we could do that and then deploy that capital in a, another, um, quality multifamily asset that checks all of our return and uh, all of our criteria boxes. Um, but if the market takes a turn, we want to be able to batter down the hatches and weather through the storm. And having that longer hold period really facilitates that. And again, just really removing the variable of time and just not forcing us to make a decision, but allowing us to make that decision to dispose of the asset to sell in the ideal environment is incredibly important. So let's talk about recession, yield curve reversion. It's really related to cap rate expansion because I, we would see cap rate expansion most likely during a recession as we look, as we look back in a positive economic environment, even as interest rates rise, there's not much correlation. Um, but uh, let's look at, let's look at the yield curve right now. This is from last night. Um, we're looking at the 10-year 10 10-year 10 treasury minus two-year treasury um, in blue, and then the 10-year treasury um, subtracting by the three-month treasury. So looking at kind of the um, the longest and kind of a middle duration and the longer and a very short duration. And then these gray areas are recessions. You can see that you know the yield curve 
uh, recession, all the past recessions have been um, predated by an inversion of the yield, yield curve, even the coronavirus pandemic, um, which uh, many people were anticipating a recession um, prior, prior to COVID really picking up steam. And well, we, we did have one, although it was the shortest, it was a very short recession. You can see on the far right of your screen, that blue line is it's getting pretty low. And that's the 10 minus two um, year spread. But I would also say, and again, this is why we're doing this to quantify the the 10 year minus the three month spread is is not is going to really go in the opposite direction. Um, most of the interest rates um, are either based for multifamily or either based off the 10 year treasury or they're based off of the 30 day SOFA rate. And the SOFA rates, which are going to be much closer to even very shorter duration than the three-month treasury, they're still staying very um, tight. And actually, the SOFA rate has remained unchanged at 0.05%. So what can we do in a recession? Again, similar to cap rate expansion, but more stable markets, ability to hold long. But then two tactics that we can um, utilize, and we do this for all of our projects. Um, you know, we, we've just learned this over time is have excess cash reserves, the ability to, you know, really to hold through. Um, if we see a drop in occupancy or no rent growth, you know, we still have cash reserves if something happens at the property. Another key tactic that we're really focused on is targeting median demographics. Um, so median demographics is we're not targeting the highest of the highest of the high end. We're also not targeting kind of the lowest of the, of the low end. So we're really targeting most of the assets are going to be kind of solid B class properties. We may have a nice A minus property. We may have a C plus property that we're going to take to a B property. But for the vast majority, the assets in the gray fund are right down the middle B class. The reason for that is the largest percentage of the population can afford to rent in these communities. So if there is a recession and as people move from higher incomes and they move down through the ladder, well, they're going to be moving out of those higher end apartment units or they're, they're selling their home. They're moving into B-class apartments. Then on the upswing, the opposite happens. We have people moving up from C-class apartments through B-class apartments. In general, that's where the majority of demand is. And as you know, individuals kind of move around wherever they are, kind of in the economic spectrum of their income levels and their ability to pay, there's always a large, large group that can't afford to pay those rents. So targeting those median demographics is a way to really insulate ourselves from some of the more extreme volatility we might see during a recession. Probably weren't expecting to talk about deflation in today's environment when I believe the CPI print yesterday was what 7.8% or on Wednesday was 7. Point, no, Thursday 7.8%. Um, absolutely incredible. I mean, we're seeing higher inflation we've seen in over 40 years, but I'm still going to talk about deflation because inflation is not a real risk to multifamily. Certainly the macro and macroeconomic, you know, second, third, fourth order uh, effects could affect the broader economy, which could put us into a recession. And that would affect multifamily, but inflation itself is, is not a risk to multifamily. But deflation is, and it's not a risk. Um, it's not a clear and present risk at the moment, but it's one of the bigger risks that is out there that is, uh, that is worth mentioning. A lot of this is driven by, you know, slowing population growth, um, an aging population, the technological, te technological advancements, which are highly deflationary. Um, we see this growth rate trend over basically to the next, call it 80 years or so. And we're really seeing you know, a slowdown in the growth rate. You can see that um, projected, again, we're just going to have an older population, a graying population, and that's going to create more dependency when you're in your older age, you're not spending as much money. The velocity is lower. You're not, uh, you do not have obviously having kids, buying more stuff. Um, you know, you're retired. Um, and it also, you know, requires more resources to take care of people. So this is a chart um, that the Census Bureau put out of just dependency, looking at youth dependency, old, j old age dependency, and just total dependency. You can see by about 2030, we're going to be at a dependency level that we haven't seen really since um, the 1970s. Um, but we're, you know, we're relatively okay for the next 10 years or so. And then that's not a, in itself a major risk factor, but they're all forces that create um, a slower growth economy. And 
wrapping into kind of a deflationary environment and population growth, um, one of the biggest risk factors, this could have been a risk factor all in itself, is really lack of um, immigration to the United States. Um, as you can see, all, most of this population growth is supported by net immigration to the United States. If we do not have continued immigration to the United States, we will have a declining population here before we know it. You see these projections, you know, in 2020, the majority of the natural increases are from people born here in the United States. In 2030, that that's that switches. That's not the case. Um, it's all of a sudden a, a 1 to 1.1 ratio of natural increases compared to net international migration. By 2040, it's going to be completely offset at 0.6 natural increases and 1.1 um, for net international migration. Um, so if we don't allow people to keep coming to this country, you know, in a safe way, we are going to see a declining population and a slower growth economy. So what can we do? We can force appreciation again. So if we have slow rates of growth, slow rent growth, um, we can always force appreciation through our value add business plans to create the right type of housing unit for that environment. Um, we're also looking for growth markets. We don't want to be in those markets that are you know, not growing or really stagnant. Um, may also mean not being in some markets that, um, you know, maybe have volatility exposure based on immigration. So we don't know what immigration policy is going to be. Um, but also markets that have that are low supply, low construction supply. That way we're just there's that less risk of building up, seeing a population decline and just having too many housing units. The last risk, um, I almost forgot to include this, um, but it, it, it's one of the most immediate. Um, that's government intervention. This is a map of rent control um, across the United States right now. Um, you can see, you know, most of the Midwest and the Sun Belt is, you know, relatively free of rent control, but you know, there's nothing that can get in the way of a business plan um, like the government coming in and telling you. Um, what you can or cannot do. And so this is something to really pay attention to and something we've been keenly focused on um, in targeting markets that are just more business friendly, tax friendly, and there's just not the prospect of rent control. That's why, you know, we're investing, um, you know, really throughout the Midwest, but we're not investing in Illinois um, for not only rent control, but um, there's a lot of other issues just with their, with their state government not being as landlord friendly, not being as tax friendly, and again, there's just there are just greener pastures elsewhere. And then there's you know new types of legislation. New York just announced that, that's working through their system this good cause eviction law, which is essentially a de facto rent control by another name. Um, that essentially you're gonna even if someone doesn't pay, you still have to have a, another reason to evict them. What can we do again? Um, landlord friendly markets, geographic diversification. So if you know if you're in one state, one market that all of a sudden city council passes some ordinance, you know, that's not all of your eggs aren't in that basket. I mean, also in um, more suburban markets that may be in counties outside of the the immediate you know city, um, they may be insulated from some of those those rent control measures as they may only affect the city themselves. So that kind of is also in line with some of the themes that we're looking at. So those are the risk factors that we're seeing in the multifamily market. Again, any questions, other risk factors that you're seeing, please feel, you know, let me know, put them in the chat, be happy to discuss them. Um, but now I'd want to take um, just a couple of minutes to give you an overview of two assets that are under LOI. Um, that'll be the first two assets in the gray fund. We're incredibly excited. Um, it's a competitive market out there. Um, we've had to be tactical. We've, I mean, our team has been working tirelessly on filling up our pipeline. And we've had, we've had a pipeline of over $600 million this year of assets. I probably, I think probably now close to 700 million. Um, we, we've lost out on, on the majority of those um, because we're being disciplined. We're not chasing deals. We're trying to find real opportunities where we can actually try to get some built-in equity into the deal if possible. Very little is going off market. Almost everything is going through brokers, um, but we actually do have a project that we are getting um, off market is through a broker, but it did not go through the marketing process, which is just incredibly rare these days because we're seeing on average 10 to 15% increases from the whisper prices 
compared to the actual contract and sales prices. Um, we pursued a portfolio recently that had a whisper price of $152 million for the three property portfolio in Indianapolis. I think we mentioned it on the last webinar. We just got word that the event, we, we backed out. Um, we, we had a line in the sand. Eventually is going to trade for $167 million, up again from $152 million. In the past, the whisper price, the whisper price is because most properties don't have a listed price, but the broker will tell everybody what the price is essentially. And in the past, um, really prior to 2020, most properties would sell at or near that whisper price. We bought properties in 2020 for under whisper. Um, now assets are all going again 10 to 15 percent over whisper. It's a very competitive market, and it underscores the importance to be disciplined, have criteria, and not to chase deals and get caught up in just in just chasing the next thing. That's why it's important to have a very full pipeline. Um, you know, like uh, like in a negotiating term, we want to have a best alternative to you know negotiated out, um, outcome. We want to have an alternative, and that's why having a full pipeline, we're not so set on one asset that will do anything to win it. Because at the end of the day, if we can't perform, it, it's it's all for naught. And I told you know Jay Reader, who's our um, senior vice president of acquisitions and asset management. Um, you know, he, he was our first employee that we hired. And I told him on the first day um, that he worked with us that I, I told him, I never, I never want to, we never will do a deal just to do a deal. We're only going to do good deals. And we're going to pass on a lot. And I'm proud to say we've done that and we're still doing that. And it's time, and, but it's hard. It's hard in a market when there's so much growth, there's so much speculation, but it's just that much more important to stay disciplined. So let's take a look at Take a look at these two deals. Again, these are under LOI, so I can't share everything about these projects. I can't share the name. I really shouldn't even be sharing how many units it is. Um, but the first asset is in Indianapolis. It's in the Mount Comfort submarket. That's on the far east side of Indianapolis. It's, it's essentially right next to Hancock County. Um, it's a B-class community built in 1990. Um, 122 units total. Um, 60 of the units have not been touched at all. Um, the rest of the units have, have gone through various stages of renovation. Some just have had the, the floors done. Some have had a full renovation. It's currently 95% ocup occupied, way below market though, 200 to $300 below just the market comps in the immediate submarket. And then when we're looking at um, properties that were slightly higher um, level, we believe that we can get another $200 post renovation. And the previous owner, has been successfully achieving these $200 rent premiums on some of the units that they have renovated. But there's still an incredible amount of meat on the bone at this property, and there's a lot of work to do, and there's a ton of opportunities to really elevate it to the next level. Um, all units have washer and dryers, 16% current rent growth going on in the area and at the property. Um, but the reason why we like this specific location, this property, is the immediate adjacency to a booming industrial um, area. Uh, there is currently in Indianapolis, there's 21 million square feet of industrial being built. It's the fourth largest or the fourth hottest market for industrial development. And a lot of that is taking place just a mile or so down the road from this property. It, it's absolutely incredible. Um, I'm gonna, here's some of the pictures of the classic units that will be renovating. Um, I get back and get back to these. These are some of the, the renovated units. See, they still there's still some work to do. The cabinets, I think, still can be replaced to really get a, an additional premium. Um, we'll go through some of the jobs in, in this area, but the amount of industrial being built. I took the some of the team out to the submarket a couple of days ago um, because I've been I've I've been out there a handful of times. Obviously, we've toured it. We've been doing research. We live in the market. I said, but guys, we have to go over to where all, this is all being built. There is just millions upon millions that's existing and then it's being built. And this is going to mean jobs and more jobs and decently high paying jobs that fit right in the target income brackets that we are looking for at this property. And there is no, there's no new construction in the pipeline, zero new construction on the east side of Indianapolis in this area. No new construction. Um, but we just drive around. This is just a few pictures. So, I mean, there's a ton of existing industrial, um, variety of different um, types of, it's mostly warehousing, logistics, and some manufacturing. 
I mean, you've got your Amazons. I mean, Walmart has a massive multi-million square foot facility. Um, and then there's a ton that's just been built. It's leasing. Um, they have, you know, there's so much infrastructure out this in this area right now for all the construction. Um, there's now hiring signs everywhere you look. And again, they're all paying typically, you know, 20, this, I mean, this is 2640. Um, we did a survey in the area. Salaries range anywhere from really $17 all the way up to $40. Um, and so there's a lot of really solid jobs coming into this area, again, with no new supply. Um, a little bit more of just a, about just the, this, just this general area. They've had 10% employment growth over the last 10 years. And again, it's just, it's very diversified. Um, it's a very diversified employment base as well. As you can see this chart, there's really, um, there's really not the largest sector, it was only 17% of the employment base. And then you can see um, just the amount of job population growth forecast for the Mount Comfort Corridor, which is where the property is, even compared to Indianapolis, um, which Indianapolis is, um, you know, growing, you know, pretty steadily, you know, just under 1% population growth a year. This, this area is growing cl uh, closer um, to one and a half percent and has been growing up to two percent in recent years. I did want to just to show you, I, I did a quick video while we were out touring the property. Um, again, I can't share the name of the property, but we did want to give you just kind of a quick overview, a little bit of a sneak peek of what the property looks like. Um, it's a mostly all brick exterior. Um, some of the roofs have been replaced recently, although we will be putting some of the other roofs on a replacement schedule itself. You can see it's a really nice suburban location. Um, you know, I'd say, you know, relatively blue collar and gray collar. Here's a little view of the clubhouse and an amenity space. See, there's a lot of opportunity to fix up this playground. They've got a nice little picnic area. We've talked about either adding a splash pad, um, to the to this area we've also talked about adding a um, soccer field as well and this is a just higher aerial view you can see um, i-70 um, just in front of us this is a major you know interstate that runs through indianapolis so great interstate access um, you can see a, there's an elementary and middle school just right down the street so there's great proximity um, for families the unit mix at this property um, really catered itself to perfect unit mix for kind of a suburban lifestyle. It's mostly two bedrooms, three bedrooms. So it facilitates the desire for people to either have an extra bedroom or be able to have a family. But now you can look just a little bit of a far, you can see all these white boxes, all these white roofs. And that doesn't even count everything that's under construction, all the dirt that is being moved right now. And so we just want to take a little bit closer look at some of this industrial, a little, about a little less than a mile away. It's incredible. Again, millions and millions of square feet, not a single new apartment being built in the submarket. There are new single family homes being built. Um, most of those are kind of in the high 200,000s up to really $400,000 range. Um, but you know, again, most individuals are not gonna be able to unfortunately afford many of those homes. And then there's just this massive um, facility. I believe this is gonna be a, a Walmart um, distribution facility itself. So the return profile for asset one um, projected at about just under 10% average cash on cash over a five year period, about a 20% uh, projected IRR and a 2.3 X over five years. Um, so we feel as though this is a very, the risk return profile is very attractive to this asset. It's maybe one of the higher returning a assets um, in the fund, possibly not. And then this is all we're utilizing cap rates that are well above um, current cap rates. You know, again, most assets are trading in the mid to low fours. You know, we're assuming all kind of mid to high five percent exit cap rates. All right, asset two. A little less information on this one because it's a little bit newer. Um, it's in Lansing, Mission, Michigan. Uh, it's in the Acumas, uh submarket. And it's, a, it's 406 units. So it's a, it's a big property, major value add opportunity. It's B class built in 1989. It's currently 97% occupied. Rents are 150 to 250 below the comps. But there's a huge opportunity for a, to do a high end renovation. Um, 
the primary reason for that is just be, the market demographics in this area are incredible. I'm just going to go to the incomes. You always it's you don't always see this, but you want obviously the demographics to get better closer to your property. And you can see just the median household income in two mile radius is 86,000. The average household income in two mile radius is 110. You can see as you get further away, they decline. And so we're in the right location. There's a major corporate headquarters, caddy corner to this property. Um, and then there's a major, um, well, Michigan State University is also kind of in the other caddy corner. Um, Lansing's the state capital. So we have meds, eds, lots of jobs, high incomes, and almost I think there is 60 units currently in the pipeline for this market. So low supply, high demand, high incomes, business, tax friendly. It's really everything that we'd want to see. And it's a beautiful asset as well. Um, it does need some interior renovation, um, probably a little bit of exterior work as well, but is right down the fairway for the gray fund portfolio. profile um, a little bit less just because we, we're not really baking in um, the strong market so we're not using as low of a cap rate as we should but still strong cash flow seven and three quarters percent um, 18.7 percent projected IRR over five years in a 2.1 X equity multiple over five years itself if you'd like to learn more about the Gray Fund, um, please just pop over. You can just, just type in your browser, gray.fund should take you right there. Um, or you can go to graycapitalllc.com to learn more. And if you're already an investor, if you have a uh, profile on our investment portal, um, you can go into your investment portal right now and execute the deal documents and sign up for the fund it's, itself. Um, if you have any questions though, or if you wanna just want, me to, want to be sent the documents directly, Feel free to email me, Spencer at GreatCapitalLLC.com. Happy to answer any questions, walk you through the process. But again, to get the deck, go to Gray.Fund to sign up, GreatCapitalLLC.com, and log into the Great Capital Investment Portal. Well, I appreciate everyone taking the time again. Another busy Saturday. Um, we're going to write it at, at an hour. Um, so I can very much appreciate it. I hope this was informative. Learn a little bit about the multifamily market. Learn a little bit more about the Gray Fund, some of the assets we're targeting. Um, what makes us excited for the market right now? Um, I think we're in one of the most exciting investment environments, specifically for multifamily, that we may ever see. Um, it can't be underscored what an accelerator inflation is to multifamily. We're essentially pouring jet fuel um, on a market that's already doing quite well. And so please, um, if anyone has any questions, um, more than welcome to put them in the chat. Um, but again, I'm also more than happy to answer them offline. Feel free to send me an email. Um, you can also send William Costello, um, our investment associate, Great Capital, William at greatcapitalllc.com if you've been speaking with William. But in general, we're just looking forward to speaking with you. Appreciate it, Navin. Appreciate you. You've been on the webinar as well. Claudia, thank you very much. Blake, I appreciate it. All right, well, I, I must have been relatively concise and answered a lot of questions already. Again, please feel free to reach out to me directly, Spencer at GreatCapitalLLC.com. Pop on over to Gray.Fund or GreatCapitalLLC.com LLC .com to just start the process right away. We will be making a, um, we will be uh, having a replay of this video. We'll also be uploading it to YouTube so you can um, watch back through. We don't necessarily have the slides available. If you're interested in any of these slides or any of the research reports um, that were in this presentation, for, feel free to send me an email. I'd be happy to send you over the presentation, even though it's not necessarily set up like a deck. Um, and also happy to send over some of those research reports um, from Bercadia, Marcus and Millichap, NAR, um, and CoStar that was used to um, kind of put all this together. All right, everyone. I hope you have a great weekend, great Saturday. Again, any questions about the Gray Fund, please feel free to reach out. All right, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.